do. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions, um, definitely in the media and definitely probably with your all's interactions with pharmacists probably so far. And then we'll talk specifically about um, paths to becoming a pharmacist. Okay, so briefly about me. So I'm from Kentucky originally, um, born and raised there. I went to a super small undergraduate college called Center College in Kentucky. Um, I then went on to University of North Carolina Eshelman School of Pharmacy, where I got my PharmD degree. Um, we'll talk specifically about undergrad versus grad school, et cetera, for pharmacy. Um, I then did a pharmacy residency, a clinical pharmacy residency. I stayed in Chapel Hill at UNC Medical Center. Um, I did my first year, which is generalized, and then my second year, I specialized in oncology. Um, and again, we'll talk specifically about the nuances of pharmacy training and kind of what that looks like. Um, the way Davina and I have gotten to know each other is I also, um, well, I honestly feels like I used to do this, um, dedicate a big portion of my social media presence to kind of showing my life and my journey in pharmacy. Um, so I created this account that almost three years ago now, and I will have to say did a lot more of this back when I was a student, but um, still try to show some, some of my life as a pharmacist and give kind of tips and tricks to anyone else pursuing pharmacy as a career path. Okay, so let's talk specifically about working as a pharmacist. Um, many of you can probably tell me where you've seen pharmacists working. Most commonly, that's probably at something like CVS. I think I see some nodding. That's probably where most people think that they most likely will encounter pharmacists. Um, there are several different areas of pharmacy practice. Community is definitely the most common or the one you think of most. So that can be at an independent local pharmacy or a chain like CVS or Walgreens or Rite Aid, et cetera. Um, what many people do not know, and still what most of my family has had to learn since I entered the pharmacy career path, is that there are several other areas that pharmacists um, play a huge role in. So the hospital is a big one. Obviously, I'm biased. This is where I work. I am a clinical pharmacist. Um, a big thing that many people do not know is that every single medication or Order that is placed in the hospital has to be verified by a pharmacist. That medication cannot be pulled from by the nurse from the, I'm trying to use the correct term, medication dispensing cabinet, like the automatic where it stores medicines on the floor. It cannot be pulled unless the pharmacist verifies the order. Um, so that's a big misconception, but we are like right there alongside the physicians in the hospital helping to make those therapeutic decisions. And then again, we are on the back end checking all of those orders to make sure that it is safe and appropriate for the patients. And so pharmacists play a huge, often hidden role in hospitals, but obviously a very important one. Um, Long-term care. So pharmacists also can work at hospice facilities, other kind of inpatient facilities. They play a huge role there. Um, pharma and the pharmaceutical industry. So you're probably aware, obviously, that pharmacists have to work in pharma. That kind of makes sense. But pharmacists can play a huge variety of roles in pharma. They can be more on the development side. So working to develop medications, working with clinical trials. Again, every, all those medicines have to be checked and verified by a pharmacist before they can get to a patient. A lot of pharmacists also may work more in the sales side of things. So they can work as medical science liaisons. A lot of times having someone who's had experience with medicines in clinical practice and then can go talk about them to other clinical providers, that's huge. And then there's also big opportunities for pharmacists and government associations like the FDA. So I won't spend too much time on here, but pharmacists are super important and we're becoming more and more important as more and more medications come to market. 20 years ago, there's like, I, I should get the exact stats, but there's like only a small portion of medicines on the market 20 years ago, as there are now. You see the commercials, there's new meds coming out all the time, which is really exciting. But think about our physician colleagues and people who go through med school, you get like two semesters of pharmacology, like that's it, because you have to learn so many other things. And so we as pharmacists dedicate all of our training to medicines, knowing how they work, um, how they are safe in patients, drug interactions are huge, if you've heard of Paxlovid, so many drug interactions. So we play a super important role and it's growing every single day based on the number of medicines that come to market. There's no way our physician and nursing colleagues can know all about medicines like we know just because they have to deal with learn so many other stuff too. And so we really get to be the medication experts. This is some, some more stats, but very needed. Okay, so this is one of my favorite slides, but 
why pharmacy? So I obviously am biased. I love the pharmacy career path. Um, a little bit more back about me in college. So I always knew that I wanted to go into some type of type of healthcare. A lot of you on this call are probably like that. You want to do some kind of healthcare, whether that be medicine, nursing, dentistry, etc. I had kind of decided back in undergrad that I was like, all right, pre-med, go to med school, become a dentist or a pharmacist. Those were like my three kind of options that I was thinking about. Um, and I'm happy to talk specifically about more about what, how I made my decision, but the main thing for me, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but in general, why pharmacy? Like I was just saying, we are integral parts of the healthcare team, sometimes hidden, especially in the media. You don't ever see pharmacists on Grey's Anatomy, which makes me so mad because like we are right there in the hospital every single day. Um, but we're super important. Look at some of these tweets here on the right. These are some of my favorites that I just added, but if you're not on Twitter, you should be, especially like professional Twitter, but the pharmacist love from our physician and nursing colleagues is like big time on Twitter. And so here's just a couple of examples um, of how important we are to the medical teams. Um, as I mentioned before, there's many different fields to choose from. So you could wanna work in the community setting. You could wanna work in the healthcare clinical setting. You could say, I don't wanna deal with patients, but I love the drug side of things. I wanna go work for pharma. And that's also an opportunity as well. Um, lots of opportunities nationwide and then super dynamic. So the pharmacy field, because how, how many medicines are coming to market constantly changing, and there's lots of more opportunities for pharmacists to kind of have a seat at the table and excellent earning potential as well. All right. So let's talk specifically about the path to becoming a pharmacist. I'm not sure where most of you are, if most of you are an undergrad or high school or even younger, but hopefully this will be a good overview. So the first thing to becoming a pharmacist is you have to get pre-pharmacy education. This is, I'm thinking like undergrad is what we call it. So you have to get your prerequisites for an undergrad before going on to pharmacy school or graduate school to get your PharmD degree. Um, two years is really possible. You can get all of your credits within two years. I will say I've seen more in recent years, the majority, at least of my classmates in pharmacy school were um, had gotten their four year undergraduate degree first, not required. You just have to get your two years of prerequisites. Of course, every pharmacy school is a little bit different, but just know that it is possible to do it with just two years of undergraduate credits before going on to grad school. But I will say the majority, I think that I've seen kind of do three or four years before going on, but it is an option. Um, we have to take, you've probably heard of the MCAT. We have a pharmacy version of that called the PCAT. Um, it has all the things you probably expect. It has organic chemistry, um, good amount of math. I'm like, this has been so long since I've taken this. Um, reading, writing, kind of all, all of that sort of thing. Um, but the PCAT is super important. So that's something you, you do have to take before applying to pharmacy school. And then going to pharmacy school, you'll get your PharmD degree. It's a doctorate degree. So we are doctors. Um, it's four years. And I think there's some actually moving to like a three-year program, but in general, it's four years. Um, what that consists of is generally two to three years are didactic. So in the classroom, just like you'd expect, but for sure, no matter what your last year and oftentimes several semesters during is all rotations. So when you're all outside of the classroom, rotating in different areas of pharmacy. And what's great about that, as in my opinion, is all those different areas of pharmacy that I talked about where pharmacists can work, you get to see a lot of those from those required rotations. So we have to do community, we have to go in the hospital, um, we have to do some things in the clinic. And so you have to get a variety of experiences there. Um, after you graduate from pharmacy school, you have to pass what's called the NAPLEX. It's our national kind of licensing exam. So just graduating from pharmacy school doesn't allow you just to practice pharmacy. You have to take this big NAPLEX test. Um, I'll just, it's really not a hard test if you survive pharmacy school. That's all I'll say. It's, it's pretty like kind of like a check the box kind of thing. Um, the path that I took, again, because I am working as a pharmacist in the hospital, um, most, most of the time is not required, but most of the time um, it is encouraged to complete a pharmacy residency program. So you've probably heard of medical residency. It's very similar. However, our length is much shorter. So the first year of pharmacy residency is generalized. You're not going to find any specialty PGY-1 pharmacy programs. 
Um, you can have some PGY-1 programs that are maybe more focused inpatient, some that are more focused in the outpatient clinics. Those can be some different differentiations, but in general, your PGY-1 is going to be general clinical. So think about like the first three years of internal medicine residency for medical residents. You don't get to specialize yet. Once you finish that first year though, your second year is now specialized. And so that's what I did. I did my first year general and my second year I specialized in oncology. And so that is definitely an option. Here's just some of the specialties that I listed on here um, that folks can pursue. Um, trying to think if I hit most of them. I think so. Um, but then, so to break that down, postgraduate training for pharmacy, if you want to work in the clinical healthcare setting, first year's general, second year is specialized. So it's a max of two years. So if you think about comparing that to um, other types of healthcare careers like medicine, that's where you're looking at three years of residency, no matter what, and then like three years of fellowship on top of that. That's just like medicine. Surgery is like a whole other ballgame. So another pro tip or like a plug for pharmacy there. Okay, so is a career in pharmacy right for me? So in general, most of you that are here, I'm assuming if you're here, you wanna do some type of pre-med, pre-healthcare path. And so if you've already kind of settled on that, um, you have a few options, which is I think is really great. Pharmacy should always, always be on the table. Again, obviously I'm biased, but um, it's, it's incredibly rewarding. So if you wanna work in healthcare, but you're also fascinated by medicines and you're like, wow, I would love to be like a medication expert and know all of those things. Something else that I will say that for me actually was a factor in me cho choosing pharmacy over something like nursing or medicine. I get really queasy with blood and things and I didn't want to touch people. And that was like a big thing for me. I'll be honest in like pursuing healthcare. We do get vaccines. I don't mind giving vaccines. That's fine. But like blood and stuff, um, I don't think, I don't think I could do. And so that is nice for me with pharmacy is that I get to work with medicines and still talk to people, but I don't have to do like physical exams or anything like that. Um, I will say another plug for pharmacy. Like I said, it's less years of post-grad training, even if you even do post-grad training. And then finally, my favorite thing probably is the ability to fluctuate between different career settings. So I'm clinical now, I'm working in the hospital, I'm specializing as a bone marrow transplant pharmacist, but one day if I wanna go work for pharma, then I think I might. And that is definitely something that I'm thinking about one day um, transitioning to, which is definitely cool that just with this degree, I can work in so many different settings. All right, so that was it. That was my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys may have and feel free to reach out either on Instagram or um, email is probably not the best right now, but Instagram would be great if you have any other questions. Um, so I just saw a question, what did I major in as an undergrad? So I was a biology major. Um, so your run of the mill, if you're going to get your prerequisites um, to go work in pharmacy, just any kind of um, science major would, would be good. I think they have, and I went to a liberal arts college, but I think they have like at big universities, like pharmacy sciences or something as a major, which like sets you up really well for pharmacy school. So typical day for a pharmacy student, that's a good question. Um, so I will say it depends kind of where you're at in your training. For the most part, it's going to consist of a few classes. Um, I will say it's less classes. It's, it's generally like a, I would say a college um, class schedule. Um, we also sometimes will have compounding labs. So we do learn how to compound medicines, which is cool. I will say I haven't done, I haven't taken any of that knowledge with me, like in my job now, but like you have to go through it, which is, which is kind of cool. Um, and then yeah, typical classes. And then, like I said, you're definitely in your last year, sometimes your last year and a half is all rotation. So you're done with the classroom setting and then you go to just rotate around to different, um, settings, um, question about working hours. So that totally depends on where, what type of setting you work in. Right. So I will say if you're working in the hospital setting, um, it's generally, if you're working inpatient, you generally have to work some weekends, but you always get what we call comp days. So it's like you work a weekend and then you get two days off kind of thing. But I will say it's, it's not a lot of weekends. It's usually just a few per year. Me, I'm going to be working in a clinic setting. So outpatient, like a doctor's office. And so I'm not going to have any weekends or holidays, which would be really nice. 
if you go work in pharma, no weekends or holidays, they barely work as it is. I'm just kidding, but not really. And then if you do work in community, um, so like CVS or Walgreens, you probably will work some weekends, just thinking about um, when your CVS and Walgreens are open. Pharma is pharmaceutical industry. So the companies that uh, make and develop drugs. Um, someone asked me about oncology. Um, so I love oncology. I think um, cancer is fascinating, but also the drugs that we have are absolutely fascinating. And we are making so many strides in just in general, like in healthcare at finding cures in oncology. And so it's a really exciting and rewarding field to be part of because there's so many new chemo drugs coming out all the time. Pharmacists, again, are super, super important to the team. And so we, um, we count every single patient who's starting on chemo. A pharmacist is the one to counsel them. Like we kind of take that on. Um, we help make the chemo. We check the chemo orders. Again, thinking about all med medication orders have to be verified by a pharmacist. Chemo orders absolutely have to be verified by a pharmacist. And so we're always checking those too. Um, good last question. Someone asked about research. So absolutely. Um, so research is a huge part of what I just did my pharmacy residency. Um, so we all have, have to complete two research projects during our, um, during our training. Let me see. So many good questions. Good. Someone asked about PCAT versus MCAT. I'm not entirely sure how they're different. Um, I would say for the most part, they're probably pretty similar just because they kind of test on the same stuff and you have generally the same kind of pre-reps. Um, someone asked when I'm a specialized pharmacist, will I only be focusing on meds that in that specialty? So good question. Um, honestly, no, because some in general, when you're seeing um, I'm going to answer this. So oncology specifically, yeah, I'm going to be counseling them on chemo and dealing with their chemo, but just because someone has cancer doesn't mean all of their other like comorbidities go away. So they're still going to have high blood pressure. They still might have diabetes. And so no matter what, we're always thinking about the, those meds too, and managing those. And then with drug interactions, we're always, always needing to know what other medicines someone's on. And so we, I always say, when I see a patient, like I'm responsible for their medication list. So like that is my area of expertise. It is my task to make sure that is accurate and up to date and make sure everything is safe and appropriate. And so that's kind of what I own when I see a patient. Um, let me see some other ones. Someone, a couple of people have asked about chemistry. Um, so chemistry is definitely important just because you have to kind of get those, um, those prereqs in when you're in high school and in college, you have to go through organic chemistry. But I will say like, for me going into the clinical route, I have not dealt with a lot of chemistry things just because that's what I wanted to specialize. If you go work in pharma, where you're going to help develop drugs definitely have to know a lot more about chemistry there. So I will say I did not like organic chemistry. I really never liked it. I'm more like the people side of things um, and more of the therapy side. So learning like how med medicines work in the body, not like what's the chemical structure of medicines. And so um, that was fine for me. And that was an easy way for me to know that I wanted to go work in more clinical pharmacy rather than working in like drug development. So I will say, if you aren't a chemistry fan or you haven't done super well in chemistry, just get through it. And then like, you don't need to be an expert in that stuff. Start in pharmacy school. You will have probably like a med chem class, just learning some of the differences between drugs and what they look like, um, what their chemical structures look like, but nothing that you have to like know from a chemistry perspective. Like it's more just like learning a little bit of the structures and it really wasn't that bad. So pharmacy tech versus pharmacist, good question. So a pharmacy technician is someone who, um, again, can work in a variety of fields, but you're going to find them in most pharmacies. They're generally the ones preparing the medicines. So whether that's in the community setting, counting the pills, putting them in a bottle, that's a pharmacy tech's job, or in the hospital setting, like they're making the IVs. So they're inserting medicines into bags, they're getting all garbed up and everything. That's generally the pharmacy tech's role. Um, anyone with a college or even the high school degree, high school degree can go be a pharmacy tech. Um, and so a lot of times when you're a pharmacy student, you might work as an intern. And so you'll perform some of those responsibilities of a pharmacy technician, which I think is a great um, a great learning experience. And that's something it's a good, easy part-time job too, because you're working in a pharmacy. And so a lot of my friends and I did that when we were in pharmacy school. Um, but that's the, that's the difference. Pharmacy technician is just someone kind of assisting in the pharmacy. They don't have any of the same 
license or responsibilities of a pharmacist. Good questions. So if I had to go through my pre-pharmacy journey again, um, I absolutely would still pursue pharmacy. Um, I've been really, really happy with it um, for me just because it is, it is very rewarding. And I do think it's a very exciting field to be a part of. Um, again, the things that were important to me were being involved in patient care, but also um, being able to really be excited about medicines. And then at the same time, like I didn't want to be that main person, like doing the physical exam um, and kind of all that, but I still get to play an important role in helping decide treatment options for patients. It is very common on rounds um, in the hospital, again, pharmacist goes on rounds. You don't ever see that on Grey's Anatomy, but we're always there. Um, at kind of at the end of each patient, patient presentation, like they'll turn to pharmacy and say, hey, uh, pharmacist, do you have any recommendations? And that's when I'll recommend to change a dose of something or add something because of this lab value or something like that, or dose reduce something based on the lab value. And so that's definitely where we kind of play a role. And so I've, I've been really happy with it. I don't know if there's anything I would change, honestly. Um, someone asked about um, good majors. I'll answer that. Yeah. Neuroscience is a fine major for any kind of um, pre, pre-medicine, pre-pharmacy path. Let's see. If any of you kind of are in high school right now, someone asked about extracurriculars, um, getting some, just get, trying to be like super diverse in things that you are involved in. And so definitely do what you're passionate about because I always say it's better to be, do things you're passionate about rather than things that you're just doing to check a box or gonna look good on your resume. Um, re anything that helps with leadership is always good. Anything that kind of helps with public speaking. Again, in high school and kind of in college too, you're more developing kind of those other skills that'll help support, help you do well in pharmacy school. So um, public speaking and leadership are great, but then also making sure to keep up with your classes and keep up with your schoolwork. That's definitely the most important. Let's see. Um, psychology is definitely a possible major. I will say with psychology though, um, just make sure that you're getting your prerequisites for chemistry and biology, just because those probably are not required for your psychology major. So any pharmacy school website will have their prereqs listed. And so you can kind of browse around, like just think of one in your state um, and see what other prereqs. And that'll kind of give you a sense of what, what I need to major in in college to like hit those prereqs. Um, as far as issues and trends in the field of pharmacy, so um, there's probably, a f I mean, there's several I can probably talk about. Um, I will say like pharmacist provider status is definitely something that is always a hot topic. So you think about healthcare providers, really the definition is that they are able to provide care and get billed for it and like bill for it. And so that's a big thing, like with insurance companies and with um, Medicare um, you are, want to be able to bill for the services you provide. Right now, the only people who, who can do that are physicians or nurse practitioners and physi physician assistants working under a physician. Um, and so that is something that pharmacy, we are actively kind of working on that if we see a patient for a medication management visit, like they're referred to us because they have 35 medicines on their list and they don't know what they're taking. And that's like a safety risk. We'll have physicians refer patients to see us as pharmacists. And so we want to be able to bill for that visit. Um, I will say that some states actually have really cool opportunities for pharmacists. They can be become more independently um, practicing. And so similar to like a nurse practitioner or a PA, they can have a collaborative practice agreement and work with the physician to then see patients on their own, prescribe under their licensing agreement, um, make dose changes, all that. And so North Carolina is one of those states, which is really cool for me, actually. So I can become a clinical pharmacist practitioner and then get to prescribe medications and monitor them and see patients independently, et cetera. And so a lot of states, um, I think, are moving towards something similar. Let's see. Um, probably my favorite part about pharmacy is variety. I love being able to work with patients. And so this, this is going to, this answer will change depending on the 
setting of pharmacy that you work in. If you work in the community setting, it's probably, I love talking to people and like counseling them on their meds and helping fill their meds and seeing them every day. In pharma, it's probably, I love getting to see drugs go from like the, the bench to development to clinical trials and seeing our outcomes of that. For me, I love helping to make those clinical decisions. And so working with my physician colleagues to um, kind of have my area of expertise that I bring to the table. And so they'll ask me and say, Aaron, this patient's kidneys aren't great. Like we want to prescribe a blood pressure medicine. Like, what do you recommend? And that's like, again, where I have that area of expertise that I can kind of say, well, I think because of this drug interaction, we shouldn't do this, but because of, um, I don't know, there, whatever, something else we should do this one. And so that I think is really fun for me. I think it's like a giant puzzle a lot of times. And, um, I think medicines are really, really cool. Um, I would say personal qualities that are essential to becoming a successful pharmacist. Um, so probably, I mean, the main ones that you can probably think of. So I will say um, being able to work well with others is huge. So we collaborate a lot with physician and nursing colleagues. And so that definitely is essential, um, being able to work well with people. I will say, again, it depends on what area of pharmacy you want to work in. Do you want to talk to patients or not? And that's something that you can decide to do. Um, with your pharmacy career path. If you're like, I don't even want to see a patient, you can go work in a lab somewhere. If you're like, I want to see patients all day, every day, go work either in the community setting or in um, healthcare or in um, like the clinical setting. And so a variety of options um, there, but definitely being able to work well with others and then be um, able to be able to remember about different medicines. That's definitely something that is huge. It's something I'm always kind of working on is having that information at the, like kind of right there at the forefront of my mind. Okay. Um, any kind of last minute questions? Thank you guys for listening. I'm not sure again, like where most of you all are at in your career path, but, um, again, hundred percent biased, but I think pharmacy is fantastic field to go into if you want to work in healthcare. Um, but again, maybe you're looking for something a little bit different than the traditional kind of pre-med route. Um, with being a pharmacist, you're still a doctor. Um, you still have so many different settings that you can work in. You still get to help patients and um, medicines are fascinating and the field of pharmacy is definitely growing. So thank you guys. Feel free to reach out any other time with other questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. And what I'm attaching in the chat now is nothing new for all of our participants. It's a thank you form. So as soon as they fill it out, Erin, I'll be able to send you the form with all of the responses, thanking you for your time. And something else that we also like to do is to give our guest speakers a virtual round of applause on Zoom since we can't do that in person. So if they're going to be able to do that now, that would be lovely. But other than that, thank you so much, Erin, for taking Thanks, the time guys. to show us about pharmacy. And we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. All right. Okay, everyone. So our workshop for today is on the anatomy and physiology of the integumentary system, the nervous system, and also the cardiovascular system. Because we realize that the internet is down in a lot of provinces in Canada today, and we also have um, some students that have religious conflicts because they're celebrating Eid, we don't want the session to take too long today. So we're going to try to wrap things up hopefully before six. And of course, if you have to leave at any point for any of the reasons or any other ones, you're more than welcome to because we don't want to be holding you here. And we don't also want to be creating extra problems, especially since the internet's down and with those conflicts. But we just wanted to let you know that it's okay if you have to leave. But for right now, I'll be sending out the workshop in the chat. It's also in the Google Drive if you'd like to open it up, but it's here if you'd like to follow along download it, annotate it to submit notes, and we'll go ahead and get started. All right. Again, this is in our Google Drive in our, in, in our national folder in the session resources. So everyone should be able to open it and have it up. We, should be able to download it too if you'd like to annotate it. But everything's all up here and ready to go. Okay. So first we're gonna be talking about the nervous system. 
So we talked about some disorders of the nervous system last week and some of the stuff that we said last week was, you know, we're going to hold off on talking about some stuff until we go over the anatomy and physiology. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. So some components of the nervous system include your brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerves, sensory receptors, and your nervous system is really responsible for sensory perception. So how you feel things. So physical touch, taste, smell, hearing, etc. Mental activities like sleeping, talking, listening, simulating your muscle movements, so walking, even sleeping too, and also reflexes, and also gland secretions. So for example, the process of sweating or releasing hormones. All right, so does anybody know the difference between the CNS or the central nervous system and the PNS, the peripheral nervous system? You can either type it in the chat and you can or you can raise your hand. Either one's fine. Um, Fadi, do you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, the central nervous system, I believe, is your spinal cord and your brain. And the peripheral is all the other nerves and all the other nerve endings, all of that. Yes, perfect. Great job. And I'll also open it up in the chat, too. People are saying that... Um, CNS brain and spinal cord, PNS nerves, CNS is brain plus spine, PNS is everything else. Perfect, everyone's doing great. Like you all said, your CNS brain and spinal cord, it's your integration and command center. So essentially how, where everything is getting processed. And then your PNS or your peripheral nervous system consists of your cranial nerves and spinal nerves. And it's carrying messages to and from your spinal cord and your brain. This is just a quick diagram kind of overlying some of the different parts of both your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. So you start off with your whole nervous system, which includes, you know, brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerves, and then you break it up into your central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, like we talked about. So peripheral, peripheral nervous system, it consists, again, of your nerves that are carrying information away from your CNS and also back to it for processing. And then... With, within the PNS, you have your somatic nervous system and also your autonomic nervous, nervous system. So your somatic nervous system, it's controlling voluntary muscles and it's still transmitting sensory information to your CNS. But your autonomic nervous system, it also kind of sounds like automatic. It's controlling involuntary body functions. So like reflexes. And within your autonomic nervous system, there's even, there's, you know, you can go even further. You can have your sympathetic nervous system or your parasympathetic nervous system. So your sympathetic nervous system is kind of exciting your body to expand energy, kind of like your fight or flight. Your parasympathetic, your parasympathetic nervous system is calming your body down to conserve energy, to maintain energy, etc. So moving away from the peripheral nervous system, again, that's transmitting information away from your body or, or away from your CNS or back to your CNS. We'll go back to the CNS itself. Again, brain and spinal cord. Your spinal cord is what connects your um, brain and peripheral nervous system. This is just a quick diagram of what we've been talking about. Again, your central nervous system is in pink and your peripheral nervous system is in blue. So you can see that in all the pink areas, this is where integration is happening. So let's say you, you touch something that's really, really hot. And so that's gonna activate your heat reflex. So that information will be carried from Perhaps if you touched it with your hand or one of your fingers, it'll be carried from here to an integrating system here in your spinal cord, and then it'll go right back out the same way. Does anybody know how reflexes might be different or more automatic than perhaps other voluntary muscle simulations? Okay, we'll hear from both Fadi and Desmond. Desmond, you can go first. Is it like through like electrical, kind of like um, electrical like senses? That's how we like feel reflexes, like the connection. So when we're talking about reflexes, what we're, there's still kind of electrical simulations, right? Like you have, your neurons are getting depolarized, which is something we're gonna be talking about a little bit later too, but still getting depolarized, what I guess I'm, we're looking for is more like how does it differ perhaps than like 
if you just were to touch something that was not hot. So for example, how does the processing differ if you're touching something that's hot versus something that isn't hot? But we'll hear from Fadi and then I'll get back to you. Okay, um, so when you touch something hot, it is not sent to the brain. It's sent to the spine. The spine, I believe, has very minimal amounts of gray matter, which I believe allow for processing of, uh, of these things that could cause pain. For example, things that are overly hot. I'm not sure about overly cold, but they're not directly processed in the brain. But if I touch, for example, my table, my, my spine doesn't need to process that because touching a table that isn't hot or isn't causing me danger or isn't spiky won't cause me to have any reflexes. Yes, perfect. And great job, both of you. So that's what we were, that's kind of what we were looking for. So if you're touching something that's hot, your reflex arcs are located in your spinal cord. But if you're touching something that really isn't hot, that is not, you know, it's, you, there's no need for a reflex to pull your hand away really quickly, that information will get sent up to your brain to process. Does anyone know why it's better for reflexes to be processed in our spinal cord and not our brain? Why is it better for it to be processed there? I'll also open the chat. Yes, less time for the signal to travel for a quicker response, less damage, faster reaction. Perfect, yes. If you think about it, it would take less time for a signal to travel from your, your hand to your spinal cord, right back out to your hand. It would take more time for it to go spinal cord up to your brain and then back out to your spinal cord down out there. So we're just trying to make sure that we protect our bodies as well as we possibly can. All right, so now we'll be talking about some of the cells of the nervous system. So you have neurons that are excitable cells, they transmit electrical signals, and we also have glia. So glia are like our support cells. They surround our cells, they wrap around neurons, and they're just there to make sure that they can support the growth and the life of neurons. These are some of the cells of the nervous system. We won't go into them into too much depth just because we have them all listed out here as well as all of their functions. We will go over microglia. So does anyone know whether microglia are found in the CNS or the PNS? Amina? It's found in your CNS. Perfect, yes, they're found in your CNS. And microglia are a kind of phagocyte. Does anyone know what a phagocyte is? Desmond? Phagocyte means cell eating, right? Yeah, so like immune response cells, cells that, you know, attack for material and kind of just, they're kind of like the garbage cans. So they yeah. are taking out trash. So perfect, yes. Though I think those, those are all the questions we have for this one. Again, you're more than welcome to read through this slide if you want to learn, about, learn more about the different kinds of cells of the nervous system. Okay, the last thing we're going to be talking about in regards to the nervous system is kind of the propagation of an action potential. So for some of the disorders that we talked about last week, uh, we didn't talk about multiple sclerosis specifically, I don't think, but that's a neurological condition that involves the anatomy of the neuron that we're seeing right here. So this is a neuron. And some different parts of the neuron that you can see. You can see that here's the cell body. If you got the nucleus in there, there are the dendrites. The dendrites are what's receiving information from other neurons. You have um, the myelin that's wrapping around here. Does anyone know why myelin is so important? I'll look in the chat too. Amina? Does it chemically connect from one neuron to other one? It doesn't necessarily connect them, but it does provide a very, it, it speeds up the, the reaction time because it's kind of insulating the, um, it's insulating the neuron. So as opposed to having a neuron Call at me. the bottom, sorry. Oh, I don't know if someone was saying something. Anyways, but if you look at the neuron at the bottom, the neuron at the bottom doesn't have any. Call you know, me. It's unmyelinated. It's 540. You didn't go to... Okay. So if we're looking at the neuron at the bottom that is unmyelinated, what you can see is that the signal has to travel 
a pretty long way in terms of propagation. But if you look at the neuron at the top, it can kind of jump something called saltatory conduction from this open spot here, which is where the ion channels are. It can jump from here to here to here to here to here to here to here. And so because it's jumping, again, the myelin is preventing any signals from being, you know, kind of can like conducted or trans transmitted there. Because they're jumping, this jumping process takes a lot uh, it, it takes a lot less time as opposed to something that might have to go through this entire stretch. So essentially it's kind of just blocking off parts of the neuron and saying that like the signal, it has to jump from these different points. And that jumping is a lot faster than going through this whole thing here. All right. And so the jumping that we talked about, that's the propagation of something that's called an action potential. So that's how that's kind of the fundamental basis of the nervous system. It's how neurons send information to other neurons. It's how we're able to perceive things and, and feel and through perception, like understand what it is we're feeling or seeing or hearing. It helps us understand the anatomy of the nervous system. And it helps us understand how these electrical signals are transmitted. Because since we know that, you know, in order to perceive something, we have to first have sensory receptor, then that information has to get transmitted to something else. And then we have to process that further. There's a lot of information that's getting sent to different places. And that information is getting sent because we have things like neurons that are transmitting this information. So this is something that's called an action potential. And I'm not sure if all of you have learned this in perhaps maybe a high school anatomy class or high school bio, or maybe if you've taken an undergrad bio class, I know some of those classes cover action potentials, but we'll go over it briefly. And then you're more than welcome to maybe watch some videos at home, just because we know that this is more of a tricky topic. So we're trying to kind of cater to different education levels on this. So essentially when you have a neuron at rest, so this neuron isn't excited. No one is trying to give this neuron any, any information. She is rusting, you know, like there's, there's nothing going on and there's nothing that's really being required of the neuron at this time. So when nothing is really being required of a neuron and the neuron is at rest, its membrane potential is negative 65 or sometimes negative 70 millivolts. But if they receive information through their dendrites because someone, is, another neuron is trying to communicate with them, then what happens is there's the sodium gates open. So once your sodium gates open, sodium is a positively charged ion. So a ton of sodium starts to rush into the cell. Because sodium is a positively charged ion and we're starting at negative 65 millivolts, what happens is the cell gets increasingly less negative or a lot more positive. Once it reaches a certain threshold, then it's considered depolarized. Again, something important to know about action potentials is that it's an all or none response. You can't have, you know, half an action potential or a weak action potential or something like that. It either will happen or it won't. And whether it will happen depends on whether or not it's reaching threshold. So let's say it reaches threshold, which is usually around negative 50 millivolts, then you know that you're gonna see all of this happening. So your sodium ions are rushing in and then you kind of reach the top or the peak of this chart here. And then that's the point at which your potassium gates are opening. So all the potassium inside the cell or not all of it, but a good chunk of it, potassium is also a positively charged ion starts to leave. And because a positive charge is leaving, that means your cell is going to start getting more negative. So your depolarization happens when sodium's rushing in, repolarization happens when your potassium ions are starting to rush back out. So as your potassium rushes back out, you're slowly going back to rest. There's a little bit of something that we call the refractory period. So does anyone know the difference between an, between an absolute and a relative refractory period? And again, no worries if not. Okay, so an absolute refractory period means that essentially there's no chance that this neuron is going to fire again. Refractory periods are kind of a small period after an action potential where the neuron is kind of unable to transmit another action potentials just to prevent overstimulation. So if you have an absolute refractory period, there's no chance that you're gonna get this neuron to be stimulated again until the refractory period is over. But if you have a relative refractory period, then that means that there is still a chance if you can get the cell to reach threshold. So what we'll be talking about here is 
the overshoot or the absolute refractory period. So because you kind of see it going under negative 65 or it's kind of under that threshold, it'll be absolute. And then the resting potential is reestablished and we're back to our negative 75. So I know that this, is, this might be a lot of information and it can be kind of overwhelming, especially if you're seeing this for the first time, but really the most important part to note is that this is how information gets transmitted from the dendrites of a neuron or its receptive zone all the way down to um, its axon hillock where it can then pass that information along. And the passing of information along neurons is incredibly important because it kind of makes us who we are and it allows us to do everything that we're really able to do. So that's kind of what the action potential is meant to do. And these are more of the nitty gritty details. All right, so next we're gonna be talking about the integumentary system. So your integumentary system is kind of your body's outer layer. It's your largest sense receptor. Does anyone know what the largest organ in your body is? Amina? It's, it's your skin. Yeah, it is your skin. So the purpose of your integumentary system is to protect your body, it's to regulate your body temperature, you can also excrete like waste products via sweat, so it's keeping your body healthy. So your main structure is your skin. You also have accessory organs like hair, nails, sweat, and oil glands. Does anyone know what the more common name for cutaneous membrane is? Yes, I'm seeing it a lot in the chat, skin. Good job, everyone. Yeah, so your skin is the largest and heaviest organ in your body. It receives over a third of your body's blood supply. So it's very well vascularized. It helps you make vitamin D. It maintains your balance of fluids, so like sweating. It regulates your temperature also through sweating in some ways. And it's composed of three main layers. Does anyone know what the three main layers of the skin are? Desmond? Epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Perfect. Seeing a lot, seeing it a lot in the chat too. Good job, everyone. Okay, so your epidermis is made up of stratified squamous epithelial tissue. It's okay if you don't know what that is. We've included a picture at the bottom. That's not the most important part. We just wanted you to kind of take a look at the histology or kind of what the cells of the tissue look like. So some of the cells that you might find in your epidermis, again, epi meaning outer. So this is kind of the most superficial layer of your, um, of your skin. So some cells in your epidermis include keratinocytes, which produce keratin, melanocytes, which produce melanin, Langerhans Hans cells, which are immune response cells, and then Merkel cells, which are touch receptors. You might also learn about Merkel cells if you study the nervous system because touch receptors are also involved in our perception of touch. Does anyone know what carrot, where keratin might be found? I'll look at the chat too. Hair and nails, perfect. Yes, hair, nails, combination of both. Yes, perfect. Does anyone know what the function of melanin is? Yeah, it's a skin color, pigment, body. I was gonna say for skin color and anything that has, um, like for example, our eye color, our skin color, our hair color, anything that has color is very closely related with melanin. I was also gonna say for sleep, but that's melatonin, so yeah. No, I totally get it. Melanin and melatonin do sound very similar, but yes, great job, everyone. Seeing it a lot in the chat too, pigmentation, protection against UV, absolutely, skin color, pigmentation, great job. All right, next we have the dermis. So the dermis is made up of um, kind of flexible connective tissue. You can see it in the bottom too. We have fibroblasts, macrophages, mast cells, white blood cells. And then last but not least, we have our hypodermis. So our hypodermis is made up of adipose connective tissue. So we have adipocytes, fibroblasts, and macrophages. All right, so now we'll kind of dig in a little bit to the cardiovascular system. So 
your cardiovascular system can also be referred to as your circulatory system. So it's really, really important. And we've talked about this a lot too, especially in our first workshop. So our emergency first aid and CPRC workshop, it's your heart has an incredibly important job of getting oxygenated blood to all the parts of your body, especially your brain. Every part of our body needs oxygen to work, especially our brain. So our cardiovascular system, what is it made up of? Blood, blood vessels, and also our pulmonary and our systemic circuit. So does anyone know what the difference between pulmonary and systemic is, or the difference between our pulmonary and our systemic circuits? Body? So pulmonary refers to the tract between the heart and the lungs, and systemic refers to the tract between the heart and everywhere else. Yeah, great job. I'm seeing it a lot in the chat too, pulmonary to lungs, systemic to body. Perfect. Great job, everyone. Seeing it in the chat, great. Yeah, so pulmonary is the blood flow between your heart and your lungs, systemic blood flow from the heart to the rest of the body. You all got it right. So we're not gonna go into this into too much depth, but this is just what those circuits look like. So for your systemic circuit, you can see kind of the red and blue of how blood is flowing from your heart to all the other parts of your body. And your pulmonary circuit is kind of taking blood to and from your legs. So sometimes students get confused between the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system, which can make sense because a major part of the cardiovascular system is when heart, the heart or heart blood picks up oxygen from your lungs. So they're very interconnected, but your respiratory system is what's moving gases into and also out of the blood. So because we have, because we have lungs that contain oxygen, that's how we're able to actually pick up oxygen and make our blood oxygenated. And then this is the this is the diagram of the anatomy of the heart. You don't have to know all of the parts here. We just wanted you to get kind of an idea of what the heart kind of looks like. So as you can see here, here's your aorta, here's your superior vena cava. So your superior vena cava is kind of where the process of blood flow starts. If you remember our workshop on cardiovascular medicine, we talked about how we're going to be kind of, you know, tracking how blood flow moves through the heart. And so this is where it all starts, your superior vena cava, and then it'll move through the heart, which we're going to be talking about soon. But if there are any parts of the heart that you would like to know, you don't have to know your fossa ovalis or your, or some of these down here, but some more important parts are your superior vena cava, your right atrium, your tricuspid valve, your right ventricle, your um, aortic valve, and your, um, your left atrium, or your left, this is your left pulmonary artery, which then um, as blood is leaving, picks up oxygen, then comes back into your left atrium and then your left ventricle. So we'll go over that one more time. So your superior vena cava, then your right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, and also your left pulmonary artery. So those are, those are the major parts of the heart that you can, that are helpful to know, also your aorta. But now Sajid will be taking us through the rest of the heart and the cardiovascular system and kind of taking us through the layers and the flow of blood. Okay, thank you, Davina. Okay, so layers of the heart. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. You just need to know your work parts for this one. Pericardium, epicardium, myocardium, and endocardium. So peri means to surround something. Epi means outer. Myo means, well, myo means muscle, but in this case, it would be the middle layer of the heart, which is the, um, the thickest layer. So it's made of the heart muscle, the cardiac muscle. And then endocardium would be um, your, the layer on the inside. So detailed flow of blood. So your blood is a tissue and we will be learning how it flows through the heart. So your heart is divided into two sides and the part that divides it is called a septum. And on each side, you will have an atrium on the top and a ventricle, two ventricles uh, or one ventricle, ventricles on the bottom. And the way to remember that is 
the A in atrium means above, so that's how you can remember that. And the heart is shown in anatomical position. So we'll be learning more about anatomical position towards the end of this workshop. But really what anatomical position is the standardized way the human body is shown in a textbook. And the way this ties into this diagram is um, it's always going to be from the patient's point of view. So that's why this is the left side and this is the right side. So it's always going to be opposite. It's always going to be from the patient's point of view. And we already went over this, the upper layers are called atria and the lowest layers are called ventricles. So the first um, quadrant is called the right atrium. So there's four, four of those. Okay, so the right atrium receives venous blood and it is deoxygenated, which means it comes from the body. So any blood that comes from the body to the heart is deoxygenated because it needs oxygen. Any blood that goes from the heart to the rest of your body is already oxygenated because your body needs oxygenated blood. And it comes, uh, so it receives venous blood from the rest of your body through the superior and inferior vena cava. And those are located near the right atrium and the right ventricle respectively. And something you should remember is the difference between veins and arteries. So one way to remember what a vein does and one way to remember an artery is that A in artery means a way. So if you read the definition right here, it says carry oxygenated blood to the body and away from the heart. So any blood that's moving away from the heart is going to do that through an artery. And then a vein is going to carry the oxygenated blood to your heart. So any blood going to your heart is going to be through a vein. So the right ventricle, and that's located, you can see that in the diagram, and it receives blood from the right atrium. So any blood that goes to the right atrium from the superior vena cava goes to the right ventricle, and it does that through the tricuspid valve. And that's where the star is right there. You can see that's the tricuspid valve. And the reason why it's called the tricuspid valve is because it has three uh, flaps where the blood flows through. So from here, deoxygenated blood travels to the lungs via the pulmonary arteries. So it's moving away from the heart to your lungs. So if it's moving away from your heart, it's going to use arteries. That's what's called pulmonary arteries. And something you should note is that these arteries are the only arteries that carry deoxygenated blood. So arteries will usually carry oxygenated blood. We covered that the last slide. And you should note that because most students get that part confused. So the left atrium, you see that right there, it receives oxygenated blood returning from the lungs by the pulmonary veins. And the left ventricle is right below the left atrium and it receives blood from the left atrium through a valve known as the bicuspid or mitral valve. So bicuspid and mitral valve are interchangeable terms. So you know, be sure you know both of these because they both show up equally. So from here, blood goes to through the aortic valve. It's right there. You can see the diagram shows the arrow. Um, it goes through the aortic valve uh, to the aorta, and then the aorta distributes the blood to the rest of the body. Okay. And so let's review blood flow. Okay, so step one is, and I'll go through this briefly because there was a lot of steps. Um, blood enters through the right atrium, right there through the superior and inferior vena cava. So blood enters from superior and vena cava, um, inferior vena cava, and it goes to the right atrium and uh, through the right AV valve into the right ventricles. So it goes from here. And then blood flows through the pulmonary valve right there or into the pulmonary trunk. And then blood is distributed by right and left pulmonary arteries to the lungs. So that's where it unloads carbon dioxide and it loads up with oxygen. And then the blood returns from the lungs to the heart, um, to the left atrium, which is right over there. And then the blood in the left atrium flows through the left AV valve 
into the left ventricle. And then contraction of the left ventricle right here, simultaneous with step three, forces the aortic valve to open. So this is, so that's where the aortic valve is. And then blood flows through the aortic valve into the ascending aorta, so that arch on the top with the three um, tubes right there. And then the blood in the aorta is distributed to every organ in the body. So, and it takes a couple of times to go through this to really learn the steps. So there's a lot. Okay, next slide. Electrical currents of the heart. So your heart does have electrical currents and contractions of the heart are coordinated by the sinoatrial node. And that's known as the pacemaker. So you can see it in, on the diagram where the sinoatrial node is, it's right near the top. So when the sinoatrial node con contracts, it generates nerve impulses that travel throughout the heart wall, causing both atria to contract. So that's how the heart functions, like um, how it contracts. It's by the um, electricity, the electrical currents that's um, produced. Okay, so now we're gonna have a heart flow race interactive. So using the chat, outline the flow of the blood through the heart when I say start. So next slide. Um, okay, I'll say, okay. So it says right here, first person type out the whole process will be featured on our Instagram page as well as receive a shout out. Okay, so I'll say ready, set, go. And when I say, oh, well, okay, so on go. Start, okay, not start, and then that's what the slide says. So ready, set, go. Okay. Okay, someone already has a response over here. And I'll let Davina be the judge of this. So you guys have one more minute left to wrap this up. Okay, so seeing a lot of great things in the chat and everyone definitely has at least most of it correct. I think Harley had all of the 
major atria and ventricles and also the valves too. So congrats, Harley. We'll be featuring you on our Instagram page. But congratulations to everyone because as I'm reading through everything, everything looks everything looks great. You all got pretty much the major flow of blood through the heart. Perhaps some answers might have been like missing a valve or missing a, like an atria. But again, everything looks great. So good job, everyone. Okay, so our last part of our workshop, we'll wrap it up with anatomical position. And I was referencing this a um, couple slides ago about anatomical position. Okay. So anatomical position, as I said, was a standardized posture of the human body. So in textbooks, you'll usually see um, any um, anatomy or any body diagram in this position. So what this position allows you to do is to see the anterior or ventral um, part of the body and anterior and ventral mean front. So they both mean the same thing. And then posterior and dorsal mean back. So in the anatomical position, the legs are slightly apart. You can see that on the image to your right. And the feet and the palms are forward. So that's something I think that's a little different is the palms are forward. So we don't usually walk or stand like that with our palms forward. So I think that's kind of the only thing that's a little different. And there's an activity right here that says to cor correctly demonstrate anatomical position. I don't know if we're gonna be doing that. So I'll let Divina um, talk about that. Yeah, so if you'd like to like stand up, you know, with your arms by your side and your palms out, or if you just kind of wanna take a look at the diagram, you're more than welcome to. We won't be explicitly demonstrating it just because it's on the slide here, but if you'd like to stand up, sometimes um, people find it helpful to like lay down on a hard surface with their palms up because in medical school, sometimes pay, uh, medical students will be working with cadavers. So it's really important to understand anatomical position because the cadavers you'll be working with are on flat surfaces. So it's just important to know where everything is, but again, you're more than welcome to practice this on your own. Right, and that was the end of our workshop for today. Again, the slides are in our Google Drive and our week one homework has been released. It's in, e it's in your emails, it's on Slack, and we'll also be sending out another reminder about that too. We'll see you all on Monday for our very last session. We are excited that you have all made it all this far, but also sad because that means that our program is wrapping up. Again, we'll be re releasing another homework assignment on Monday that won't be due for a little bit. It's more of a feedback form and it's more in depth than the one that we released first. Again, your feedback is very, very important to us. That's how we've been creating our programs this far. It's through getting the feedback from all of you and making the changes. So when this program started, we didn't really do any interactives. We didn't have a research symposium, but because students told us that they wanted us to ask questions, they wanted us to ask questions or like play games throughout the meetings and have them talk to each other and perhaps present research that they've been working on. Those are those have all been really new additions to our program. So we really do value your feedback. I go through all of the responses personally to make sure that everything you're saying is something that we incorporate into our programs. And so on Monday, we'll see you then. We'll have the homework ready for you. Again, all the research symposium teams have been made. You can keep messaging me if you still need a team. We'll be taking a group picture on Monday. So please turn your camera for 10 or 15 seconds if you're comfortable doing that. And we'll be sending out the group pictures after the program is done. But if not, we hope you have a lovely rest of your weekend and we'll see you back on Monday.